Good afternoon. The first item of business today is consideration of business motion 8733 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. I would ask any member who wishes, wishes to speak against it to say so now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8733. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak against the motion. The question is therefore that motion 8733 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. We now move on to the first uh, substantive item of business, which is portfolio questions. And we start with question number one from Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the 2017 Basic Payment Scheme. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Presiding officer, through the Basic Payment Scheme to 2017 loan scheme, the majority of farmers and crofters are receiving up to 90% of their basic payment support earlier than ever before. As of the beginning of November, £292 million has been paid to more than 12,000 businesses, uh, demonstrating the Scottish Government's commitment to supporting and providing security to the rural economy. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that given that uh, the money is reaching rural areas and farmers earlier than ever before, quicker than ever before, this gives much needed certainty to the rural economy as a whole, businesses that depend on agriculture, and can he confirm that even though the deadline may have passed, farmers and crofters can still apply for an interest-free loan if that's the decision they wish to make? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, I do believe that the, the uh, loan payments have been welcomed and the fact that they were paid uh, a week or so earlier than was uh, 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 indicated at the outset has been welcomed. And of course, uh, I was determined that we pay out the maximum possible. So that's paid out in most cases at 90%, not 80% of entitlement. So I do think that that has provided um, financial certainty for farmers, crofters, and it's helped the wider economy in rural Scotland. And the second question, the answer is yes. Uh, those farmers and crofters who have yet to accept their loan offer may do so. The offers are still open for acceptance and payment. And in fact, the money is there for farmers and crofters, presiding officer. So I'm very keen that uh, they receive the money because uh, they are entitled to it. Uh, and I would encourage them to send their opt-in slips in the prepaid envelopes supplied. Any business who has not received a loan offer or who has lost their original offer should not hesitate to contact their local RPID office. Edward Mountain. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'd like to declare an interest in that I'm a partner in a farming business. The computer didn't work in 2016, didn't work in 2017, doesn't look like it's going to work in 2018. When will it work? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I must admit that the, the one thing that's predictable about the Conservatives is that the unremitting gloom of, uh, of everything they say in this topic. Uh, I, I believe, uh, and I, I believe this quite sincerely, that most farmers and crofters welcome the loan scheme. Uh, some of them have told me, some of them have thanked me, uh, and it means that the money is now in their bank accounts at a time in the run-up to Christmas when many of them make their spending decisions on new equipment, on new feedstock on, uh, on other purchases. So I think that's to be welcomed. So far as the computer system, it is working. Uh, I've made it absolutely clear it's working, and Mr. Mountain has heard me say on my innumerable appearances before his committee that that is so. It is not working to the deadlines as yet, uh, but I'm confident that we will make substantial progress, and I will come back to Parliament early in the new year to outline that progress. Uh, in the meantime, I think farmers and crofters also welcome the fact that we've set out a very clear timetable for payments across the schemes. And that too was a point that was made to me by the NFUS, whose support for the loan scheme I welcome, and by others, that they want clarity and certainty as to when they can expect to receive the funds. And that, presiding officer, is what I've sought to provide. And Rhoda Grant. <coughs> Thank you, presiding officer. Um, loans are welcome, but they're not substantive payments. Can I ask how much uh, substantive payments are outstanding for each of the years of this new scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, 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 I've got, there's a whole series of figures here, uh, but in respect of the basic payment scheme, and I will check the record on this if, uh, 
if I have erred inadvertently, I think now the basic payments scheme for 2016, we've paid 99.7%. 99.7%. Uh, uh, the Elfas payments in respect of 15 and 16 are being processed and uh, in respect of 15 we've paid 98.7%, uh, 11,216 payments. Uh, and in terms of Elfas 16, we've processed 92.3%. Uh, I won't be happy until everyone that is entitled to payment has received payment, but I think from these figures, the House can accept and indicate that we are making good progress, uh, but I shall not rest until everyone has received the payment to which they're entitled. Question number two, Peter Chapman. Right, thank you, President Officer, and I need to declare an interest as a partner in a farming business. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle reported falling farm incomes and ri rising farm debt. Cabinet Secretary. I answered a very similar question from Mr Chapman when I announced the CAP stabilisation plan. I won't repeat the full answer of what I gave then, except to remind Mr Chapman that there's a long-term trend of rising farm debt levels across the UK for the last 23 years, in fact. As for farm incomes, the long-term trend is generally upwards with a 14% increase compared to 2015. But I'm not complacent. I'm determined to do all that I can to support farmers and provide security to the rural economy. I can now confirm that we have made payments to more than 12,324 farmers and crofters of 292 million, uh, and that is, that is 46 million pounds more than the same period last year to 360 more businesses. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, there's a bigger picture here, and I'm very concerned that there is still no idea of what system of support the Cabinet Secretary is planning to put in place to support Scottish agriculture post-Brexit. Given... There's a responsibility here. Given that Westminster has guaranteed the same level of financial support to Scottish agriculture until 2022, how is the Cabinet Secretary going to use that money in a fair, transparent and innovative way to allow a profitable future for our farmers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, no, I don't accept that at all. In fact, uh, to be accurate, I don't want to be cruel to the Conservative Party, but the pledge... Oh, God! Should I? Well, the pledge wasn't to 2022. It was to the end of the current UK government, whenever that is. <laughs> we'll see. But, uh, but even, if, even if they manage to stumble on in chaos till 2022, they have not yet provided clarity on Pillar 2 funds. And indeed, I've raised this with Mr Gove in the last two multilateral meetings, most recently uh, on Monday of this week with Rosanna Cunningham, and my colleague. And I said, you know, can you confirm in writing to us that there will be payment of leader, of forestry, of aches, of all the Pillar 2 programmes up to 2022? No answer. Only farm support has been guaranteed. So all these projects on forestry, for example, that are long-term projects, we haven't got the clarity that Mr. Chapman implies. So far as post-Brexit is concerned, I'm afraid it gets rather worse for Mr. Chapman because I asked Mr. Gove again. I said this, I said, Mr. Gove, during the Brexit referendum, you said that after Brexit, the, the funding from Europe, which is worth 500 million pounds to the rural economy in Scotland, would be matched after Brexit. That's after the end of the transition period. Mr. Gove had nothing to say in that whatsoever. We are completely in the dark about the UK government's intentions to provide uh, as to what financial support will be provided post-Brexit, despite the fact that time and time again, uh, since the referendum day itself, we have asked for that clarification. And you know something, presiding officer, in conclusion, Mr. Gove said he would match the money post-Brexit. If a minister promises something, uh, he has to deliver or he has to resign. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Remind Chamber, I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, speaking of uh, bigger issues here, given the upcoming possibility of tariffs, loss of EU workers and the ending of EU rural support, what does the Cabinet Secretary currently see as the biggest threat to farm incomes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, plainly, the unanswered questions that I have just alluded to uh, and the issues around Brexit are the single biggest challenge facing farmers for decades. Uh, the loss of access to the European single market, the possibility of substantial tariffs 
the threat to Scotch lamb reliant on European markets, the threat to Scotch beef of imports from South America and other countries uh, flooding the market with cheaper uh, beef, the threat to farming generally about the imposition of border inspection posts or some other procedure which would delay the process of export uh, for perishable goods, thus rendering them potentially worthless. In none of these cases uh, do we have any clarity whatsoever from the UK government. And perhaps that's not surprising uh, because there is no Brexit plan. There is no deal. There is no plan. And finally, there's no clarity on the future of seasonal workers or EU workers. 95% of work workers in our slaughterhouses that work as uh, OVs uh, supervising the slaughter process to assure that it complies with good practice. 95% come from the EU. And we haven't had any clarity at all about whether they're welcome to stay in Scotland or not. What a disgrace. And Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. A key impact on farmers' income is, is obviously the, the, the cap payment scheme. But at the moment, a number of farmers can't properly identify or account for payments if they've received. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when the reductions and exclusions letters for the cap payment schemes, which set out what payments have been made for what schemes, will actually be issued to farmers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, these, that, the process of reduction exclusion letters is something which comes towards the end of the processing of Pillar 1 payments uh, in every year, and that process is ongoing, and I can write to the, mem with, to the uh, member with full details of, of that matter because it is a technical one. Question number three, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, President Officer. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I've just had the answer to my question in the previous reply. However, uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the UK Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Cabinet Secretary. On Monday. <laughs> Angus MacDonald. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. I note uh, that an agreement has been reached to review where we are on convergence, but as yet uh, there's still no sign of the £160 million owed to Scottish farmers and crofters. Now, some might say that that is downright theft, presiding officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure this Parliament that he'll continue to press for the return of this funding, and if received, how might it benefit hill farmers and crofters here in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Mr MacDonald is quite right to pursue uh, this, this matter doggedly, as he does. Uh, to remind members, this sum of £190 million was due to Scottish farmers, Scottish farmers alone. It came from Europe for the precise purpose of removing the gap between those who received the greatest amount per hectare and those who received the least, and those were Scottish farmers and only Scottish farmers. So that money, all of it, 190 million, was earmarked for, intended for, and designed only and exclusively for Scottish farmers. Despite that, 160 million of it, the lion's share was uh, used by the UK government to pay farmers elsewhere in the UK. That is done. Our quarrel is not with those farmers. Uh, they have received their money. That was the decision of the UK Treasury. Uh, but if the UK can find one billion pounds for a shabby deal uh, to secure the support of the DUP members to prop up uh, their chaotic, shambolic administration, then plainly, if they wish to, the Treasury can find 160 million uh, to give to the Scottish Hill farmers the money that was their due. Yesterday, uh, after pressure from uh, uh, this government and this chamber, uh, Mr Gove has uh, agreed that there will be a review of this matter, uh, and I hope to revert to members to state uh, details of an agreement that I hope will be reached with Mr Gove as to the remit, the people that carry it out, and the timescale for the conduct of that review. And I sincerely hope that that process will lead to justice for Scotland's hill farmers. Question four has been withdrawn. Question five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what investment is planned from the Strategic Timber Transport Fund. Cabinet Secretary. In the current year, an additional five million pounds has been allocated, <coughs> excuse me, for timber transport, <coughs> bringing the total invested through the Timber Transport Fund to 7.85 million pounds. Uh, this uh, funding is supporting nearly 50 projects, presiding officer, worth over £11 million that will take nearly a million lorry miles off the Scottish road network. Richard Lyle. 
Can I thank Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome what he has said. Uh, could I ask that possibly the Cabinet Secretary, since there are 50 projects, could possibly provide more detail uh, to me in relating to these projects and what this funding is supporting in the current year? Cabinet Secretary. I am not sure if the presiding officer wishes me to read out all 50 projects. Uh, <laughs> perhaps not. Um, but, uh, but I can say that all over the country, but in particular uh, rural parts, Argyll, Ayrshire, Dumfries, Highland, Murray, Perth, the borders, that uh, roads projects are going on. And this really does uh, perform very, a number of useful functions. It takes, uh, it, it takes a, a number of, uh, 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 of uh, lorry miles off the road network, one million in total. Mm -hmm. uh, it assists the environment. It assists the recovery of, uh, of timber, often trapped timber in our woods and forests. It prevents it from becoming windblown and wasted effectively. And therefore, it's good for the economy, it's good for transport, uh, and it's good for the environment. And that's why this government has injected further resources uh, to benefit rural Scotland in all these respects. Question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with angling clubs regarding the classification of rivers for 2018. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The public consultation on our proposals for river gradings for the 2018 salmon fishing season closed on 13th October 2017 with over 150 written responses received. We are now considering those responses carefully. Ms. Smith. Could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, in your letter back to me on the 1st of November about uh, river classification, uh, you indicate that Marine Scotland had not to date received any submission from the Tay District Salmon Fisheries Board when in fact their submission was lodged on the 23rd of October. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she has now had sight of that submission in which the Tay District Salmon Fisheries Board has provided substantial evidence questioning the validity of the river categorisation model that is being used by Marine Scotland and what steps she is taking to have full engagement with the Board and with angling clubs in this important matter? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, as I indicated, the uh, consultation has now closed and Marine Scotland is considering uh, the number of requests they've had for meetings um, and uh, I think in fact one meeting has already been arranged and others being discussed and others will be uh, considered so um, uh, that that is an ongoing process um, I, I think there is a, a difficulty here presiding officer because I'm not a fish scientist however I do have people who provide scientific advice and that scientific advice is advice I have to I have to listen to we don't um, accept that the model that's currently being used is fundamentally flawed. However, we do accept that there are opportunities to develop it further, and those are conversations that we are continuing to have. There are further refinements currently being discussed for the 2019 season. So this is not an absolute fixed in stone uh, position. Uh, what we do is try and continue to refine in the best possible manner with the ultimate aim, let's remember, of ensuring that we have salmon stocks for the future mm. anglers um, as well as for current anglers. Mm. Neil Findlay. Yeah, the Cabinet Secretary used to be an active and leading opponent of protection orders in rivers. Um, ironically, she's now responsible for maintaining protection orders with no end date identified for any of them. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary now commission independent research to establish whether these orders are justified or simply a ruse to keep trout anglers away from high-value salmon beets? Because after all, isn't the government supposed to be led by evidence-based policy, not finger-in-the-air stuff? Uh, this is not really a supplementary. If you have a very, very we, brief response, Minister. I, I just would like to say, Presiding Officer, we are, of course, led uh, by, uh, uh, by evidence, as I've just indicated in my response yeah. to um, Elizabeth Smith. And the uh, entire... Uh, um, uh, system of fisheries management, as I suspect the member knows perfectly well, uh, is being reconsidered uh, and, uh, uh, you know, all aspects of that will be taken on board. Question number seven, Bob Doris. Uh, thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its discussions with the UK Government regarding a fair funding deal for Scotland for railway improvements. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution raised the issue with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury in discussions on the 26th of October, in my, meantime, uh, my officials continue detailed discussions with HMT counterparts. The latest offer we receive leaves a shortfall of 600 million on what the industry tells us they need. I can assure you that our immediate priority and focus is to press Her Majesty's Treasury to secure a fair deal for Scotland's railways. Bob Doris. 
Uh, thank you, Minister, for that answer. The Minister will clearly recognise then that changes due to be introduced by the UK Government will lead to a real terms cut in funding for railway investment, do serious damage to Scotland's railways as well as to the future enhancement projects. But in particular, Minister, can I ask you for additional information, given reports have suggested that Glasgow Central Station improvement works may have to be rescheduled, delayed or cancelled? Minister. Um, can I say that you know, the member obviously makes a good point that this is not an abstract discussion or argument or uh, negotiation between two governments. It's going to have real effects. If we are £600 million short, as the current offer from the UK government stands, then it will clearly have an impact on the ambitions uh, that the industry has to improve and to enhance and to maintain Scotland's excellent uh, rail network. And this is a swindle. It's frankly uh, railway robbery. Uh, there is not a single... Uh, member or party, I should say, in this chamber that hasn't come to this government to ask for real improvements in their constituency. Quite right that they should. But if this figure of 600 million short is what we have to invest in our railways, then many, many members, right from across the political spectrum, will be deeply, deeply disappointed and their constituents will be disappointed. That's why I'm still awaiting a response from some parties in this chamber to my call to unite around the Scottish Government's ask, and not just the Scottish Government's ask, the industry's ask, because it is the industry that is saying to us they need 4.2 billion for the next control period if we want to take Scotland's uh, railways forward. So I would hope that those that haven't responded to my letter, to my call, uh, will do so, and that together we can stand up for Scotland's railways. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The data published for the last 12 months shows the Westerton to Mogai line in my and Gil Patterson's constituency was listed as the worst performer, with, regularly, with trains regularly using the practice of skipping stations and only 26% arriving in time. The major cause for this disruption is the single track. A twinned track which formerly existed would ease disruption and allow for the possibility of a rail halt, which has been proposed by Eastern Bartonshire Council. Can the Minister confirm if this possibility will be investigated with Network Rail with some urgency? Minister. Uh, yes, uh, we will, of course, and I will explore uh, that. But I would just like to put some context around some of what the member uh, very says. Briefly, very Although briefly, Minister. Although ScotRail report on time performance, of course, the uh, this industry standard is PPM, and that offers, uh, of course, a more balanced uh, approach. What I would say in terms of skip-stopping, yes, I absolutely understand uh, the member's constituents' frustration uh, skip stopping. Uh, we have said to ScotRail on many occasions that they should look to minimise that and in fairness to them during the peak time they are looking to do that. In the last 12 months 1% of trains uh, ran uh, skip stops. Uh, skip stop. Now that still 1% is 1% uh, too many. But in terms of uh, uh, the measures that she asked us to explore of course uh, I will do that and I'll give her an update on how those discussions uh, are going. And Jamie Green. Starting off, so the fact is that in control period six, spending will rise from three billion pounds to 3.6 billion pounds, and that spending per passenger in Scotland will be 39 pounds compared to 25 pounds in England and Wales. Can the minister confirm if he's now saying that it is official Scottish government policy to reject the Barnett formula funding mechanism? Minister. What the member doesn't realise is that the funding for the railways was never, ever based on the Barnett formula. The 2005 discussion between the Scottish Government and UK Government before this party came into administration was based on the regulator's 11.17% uh, agreement. Now, 11.17% is not what this government demands. It's what the industry demands. It's what is based on the advice from the regulator and the UK government has unilaterally moved away from this without any discussion and without any uh, engagement with the Scottish government. They have left us £600 million short. I see in Jamie Green's letter to me that he suggests that we lose our tax powers and indeed raise taxes. So on the one hand, Conservatives suggest... So on, some, on the one hand, the Conservatives, of course, suggest that we are the highest... falsely claim that we're the fault, uh, highest tax part uh, of the UK. On the other hand, of course, Jimmy Green suggests and alludes to in his letter dear, dear. that we have additional powers over tax and borrowing which we could use to invest okay. in our railways. So perhaps he should get his own house Minister. in order before he comes to this okay, chamber. Minister, we'll have a, point be, a brief point of order, Mr Green. It, it is brief, uh, starting off, and it's around uh, the Minister uh, purporting facts. 
Uh, he's expressed in his statement just there uh, that I said that we should increase taxes in Scotland. That is not what the letter says. That is not what the letter says. And I hope he's willing to put the matter right. Thank you. That's not a point of order, but it is a point that's been noted. We're now going to move on to questions on environment, climate change and land reform. And we'll start with question number one from Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government how it's assisting remote and rural communities with community land buyouts. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government has committed £10 million annually to the Scottish Land Fund, which supports communities to purchase land and assets. <coughs> the fund can provide support to community bodies for preparatory work, such as undertaking feasibility studies and writing business plans, as well as making awards to help actually fund land purchases. Since April 2016, the fund has supported 78 groups uh, and there is the potential for a further 25 projects to receive funding this year. Kate Forbes. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can she advise me on how, how completed and potential community buyouts in Skye, Loch Arbor and Badenoch, which includes Dingwall and the Black Isle, are helping to achieve the Scottish Government's target of one million acres of community ownership by 2020? Cabinet Secretary. Well, information is actually collated under council areas rather than parliamentary constituencies. In the course of the previous Scottish Land Fund, which ran from 2012 to 2016, nine groups within the Highland Council area received a total of £1.6 million. Last year, 16 groups within the Highland Council area received awards totalling almost £200,000. This year, up to the end of September, four groups in the area have received a total of £265,000. In total, these community buyouts have contributed just over 4,000 acres towards the target. And, and, presiding officer, can I add that I would encourage all communities to consider whether there are local community right to buy opportunities. And I would also ask colleagues in the chamber to promote this as well, and crucially, not have communities wait till land is actually being marketed uh, to put their applications in. Finlay Carson. Thank you, presiding officer. What resources, financial and or otherwise, can the government offer Kirk Maiden Community Harbour Trust in Galloway and West Dumfries to assist in them purchasing or transferring Dromore Harbour from QLTR, uh, which is the Queen's and Lord Treasurer's remembrance? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, in the specifics uh, in terms of transferring from Queen's and Lord Treasurer's remembrance, it may very well be that the, this falls under the community, community asset transfer uh, arrangement rather than the uh, community right to buy. Uh, arrangement and that has kind of slightly different uh, um, uh, uh, um, rules and regulations uh, around it and it will depend entirely uh, on what the agreement is uh, with the transferring body and if the member wishes to uh, write to me very specifically about that one which doesn't sound like it falls under the normal uh, um, community right to buy slash land fund uh, proposals I'd be happy to look further into it for him. And David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, many remote and rural communities aiming for community land buyouts will also seek to use the water exemption scheme to help pay water and waste bills. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm it is her intention to continue with the scheme for the duration of this Parliament? Is that the Minister's brief? Advice to the contrary, um, uh, and I, uh, again, I can, uh, I can double check that, but I have seen no suggestion uh, that anything other than, than that would be the case. Question number two, John McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact could be on Scotland of reported proposals in the EU withdrawal bill to abandon the principles that the polluter pays and that preventative action should be taken to avert, avert environmental damage. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I indicated uh, when I spoke to the European Environmental Bureau on uh, Monday morning, my ambition is to ensure that the principles of precaution, prevention and rectifying pollution at source, as well as the polluter pays principle, sit at the heart of Scotland's approach to environmental policy in the future, because without them, we risk lagging behind and diverging from the ambitions of our European allies. I welcome Mr Gove's acknowledgement last week that areas of environmental policy in Scotland have, and I quote, set the standard in the UK, unquote, and admitted that, again I quote, there are things that both the Scottish and Welsh administrations have done that have been admirable and in advance of what has been done in England. So, on Monday, I pressed Mr Gove to ensure that once again the UK government does follow Scotland's lead, clearly commits to the EU environmental principles, and provides clarity on how the principles will continue to shape the UK government's approach to future environmental policies and practices. Thank you. 
Uh, Scottish Environment Link have warned there's a risk that withdrawal from the EU will mean a rapid decrease in environmental standards. And even if EU legislation is incorporated into national law, there would be no legal recourse to the European Court of Justice to ensure their proper implementation. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that future environmental policy imposed by a Westminster Tory government is likely to fall short of EU standards and to protect these high standards, power over environmental policy should remain with this Scottish Parliament as laid down in the Scotland Act 1997? Well, I would uh, always want uh, powers to remain with this Scottish Parliament. Indeed, I would considerably uh, want considerably more powers to be coming to this Scottish Parliament. But I do share the members' concern. It's a key reason why I do believe that the best way to protect our environmental ambition in Scotland is to ensure the principles that I spoke about in the earlier question uh, continue to be respected and the powers of the Scottish Parliament continue to be respected. And that has to be our first priority. Devolution has been vital uh, to Scotland's uh, environment. As part of our preparations for the UK's exit from the EU, we are carefully considering whether any gaps could arise in existing domestic monitoring and enforcement powers that would need to be addressed to ensure Scotland maintains high standards of environmental protection. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to the important environmental uh, principles as highlighted on Monday. My UK Labour colleague Kerry McCarthy MP has already in the summer submitted amendments which would ensure that the EU withdrawal bill would maintain the environmental principles. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary able to clarify whether the Scottish Government supports these amendments and does she urge all Scottish MPs to support uh, Kerry McCarthy's amendments? Um, I think I need to be a little careful here since I haven't seen the detail of these amendments. Um, I will undertake to ensure that I do and I will get back to the uh, member uh, with a response to her. But if they are in general terms uh, along the lines I have been speaking about this afternoon, I really don't see that there would be any difficulty. Question number three, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it works with wildlife organisations to ensure that environmental protections are adhered to. The Scottish Government works with wildlife organisations in a number of different ways on a broad range of topics and I meet regularly with their representatives. We do value their advice and the important work that they do. John Finney. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Cabinet Secretary, you attended the European Environmental Bureau Conference the other day and your comments about the emphasis Scotland places on environmental commitments and EU protections being instrumental for safeguarding were, were warmly welcomed. Um, there's a proposal at Cool Links that would affect this. Now, I appreciate you cannot comment on a live application. However, and regardless of Brexit, if a site were subject to a special scientific interest categorisation, special protection area, in respects of the birds directive and a UNESCO Ramsar site do you believe that should continue to be respected and protected in full please well I think as the member knows I can't be drawn into comments that may impact on what is currently um, a live uh, application um, and it wouldn't be proper for me to do so in general terms the procedure for major developments is that prospective applicants are required to consult communities before any application is made. Anyone can comment. Planning authorities have to take account of a full range of views, uh, and it all is set within the context of Scotland's planning system, which does balance a variety of different interests to ensure that land use and development creates high quality, sustainable places. John Scott. Presiding officer, in light of reports of damage to and interference with legal traps, by activists and members of the public. Has the Cabinet Secretary met the Scottish Gamekeepers Association to discuss this matter and seek a resolution to this problem? And if she has not met with them yet, will she consider doing so? Cabinet Secretary. I meet with the Scottish Gamekeepers Association both officially as an organisation and often uh, individually with, uh, uh, with members uh, of the SGA. Um, and indeed their concerns around this are uh, one of the things which they raise uh, with me. Um, their concerns are fairly well known um, and all I would do is urge the Scottish Gamekeepers Association to keep bringing forward appropriate evidence and in uh, cases where what looks like illegal interference has taken place to take that evidence to the police. Question number four, Gordon Lindhurst. 
to ask the Scottish Government, in light of its strategy to tackle climate change, what action it is taking to reduce vehicle emissions? Minister Hamza Youssef. As announced in the programme for government, we will increase our efforts to support electric vehicles so that by 2032 we will have phased out the need to buy petrol or diesel cars and vans. We're also uh, taking the lead by creating Scotland's first low emission zone by 2018 and doubling the active travel budget with further measures outlined in the draft climate change plan. Gordon Linders. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware that Edinburgh Council is currently consulting on a diesel surcharge for parking permits, which could see up to 8,000 motorists being charged around £40 extra to park their cars. Uh, does the Minister agree that any such measures adopted across the country should be targeted at older cars that are worse for the environment rather than an indiscriminate charging scheme that fails to focus on the most polluting cars? Minister. I say that Edinburgh City Council, uh, whether it's the current administration or the previous administration, have a good record in terms of tackling uh, vehicle uh, emissions. I'll leave it for the local authority uh, to, to come up with the design, to come up uh, with the logistics of, of any uh, scheme that will look uh, to reduce vehicle emissions. But uh, whether it's low emission zones, uh, whether it's the, the, the scheme as pronounced by, by Edinburgh City Council, we all have a shared objective in making our urban areas and, of course, our rural areas uh, less uh, a reduction in carbon uh, emissions. But what I would say uh, to the members, though, we have to give local authorities the autonomy to do that in the way that they see fit. But, you know, he makes a val very valid point. Uh, it does seem uh, certainly logical to tackle the worst uh, emitters and worst polluters uh, first. Question number five, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve air quality in central Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Cleaner Air for Scotland, Scotland's first separate air quality strategy, sets out a comprehensive range of local and national measures to improve air quality. And these measures include development of a national low emission framework through which the 2017 programme for government has committed to introducing low emission zones in all local air quality management areas by 2023 where evidence supports such interventions. The Scottish Government also continues to provide practical and financial assistance to local authorities to support air quality monitoring and the development and implementation of action plans. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. Last month, a Sunday Herald investigation into the proliferation of super incinerators across Scotland brought concerns about pollution and public health into sharp focus. Dr Richard Dixon of Friends of the Earth Scotland has warned that whilst the Scottish Government has fine plans, and I quote, these will come to naught unless they stop this rush to incineration before it's too late, end quote. Despite cross-party and community campaigns, the Scottish Government has already allowed an appeal for one such incinerator in Hamilton, in the region that I represent. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how the Scottish Government policy on incineration is consistent with the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy? Well, every, every decision uh, that uh, will be made in respect of individual applications will uh, take all matters into consideration. And I, uh, while I don't know the details of the particular one that uh, Monica Lennon is discussing here, um, I would presume that to be the case as well. Um, we have seen in Scotland significant reductions in pollution emissions over recent decades through tighter industrial regulation, which suggests it is working, improved fuel quality, cleaner vehicles, and an increased focus on sustainable transport. We have a good record, and we're meeting both domestic and European air quality targets across much of Scotland, albeit there still might be hot spots of poorer air quality in a number of urban areas. Question number six, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact Brexit could have on climate change policy in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Scottish Ministers have had no formal discussions with UK Ministers to date on the impact of Brexit on climate change policy, nor have we seen UK Government reports or impact assessments in spite of repeated requests. In May 2017, I wrote to Nick Hurd, the UK's former climate change minister, asking for formal involvement in negotiations on the UK's future participation in the EU emissions trading system, given how central that is to us meeting our climate change targets. We had no response to that letter. On 31st of October, I wrote jointly with uh, the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe uh, to Greg Clark, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, to request immediate discussions on future EU ETS membership. Claire Perry, the Minister of State for Climate Change, has 
replied offering a discussion however formal engagement on future participation in the scheme should involve all four administrations and I made that point in my response. If the UK government has an assessment of the impact of Brexit on climate change in the UK, including Scotland, it would be in the national interest to make it public immediately. It is vital that the UK government provides clarity and certainty to people, businesses and communities in Scotland. Tom Arthur. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, given that 64% of the UK's imports in low carbon equipment comes from the European Union, does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that should the UK leave the EU without a deal, the subsequent loss of free trade would make reducing carbon emissions more expensive, consequently making climate mitigation more difficult for both Scotland and the UK as a whole? Walking away from the EU with no trade deal would be a disaster for the Scottish and UK economies. The renewable energy sector, which now supports 26,000 jobs in Scotland with a turnover of £5 billion annually, has been a major driver of Scotland's economy in recent years uh, and, we, uh, and will play an important role uh, in helping us deal with climate change in the future. And the member is right that the sector relies on the EU for low carbon equipment. Uh, that is why the negotiations to determine uh, the future relationship with Europe will need to consider this important area of policy in detail uh, with a view to safeguarding Scotland's key interests and maintaining our place as a progressive leader on climate action. Presiding officer, it really isn't good enough that we have absolutely no answers, no information at this stage in the game uh, to allow us to plan for the future. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary and members. That concludes portfolio questions.